How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourself as well. If you use this code, SpearChop10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SpearChop10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. And today, uh, we're welcoming uh, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena, uh, both former retired DE agents uh, who were part of uh, the team and the groups with the investigation and research and extreme law enforcement work to bring down the iconic, uh, most vile drug trafficker, narco-terrorist Pablo Escobar, uh, their book, Manhunters, must read. I highly suggest it. And if you follow, like I did during the pandemic, you can start watching TV shows. You want to find a new good one. I binge watched all of Narcos, and they're, they're both their lives are portrayed in that uh, show miraculously by some great acting. Um, and they also have an incredible podcast called Game of Crabs Podcast. It's streaming everywhere. They have a lot of guests on there, many of which you've been on Spear Talk. So, gentlemen, it's great to have you on here. Thank you, John. Appreciate you having us on the show. Thank you, John. And so I know we talked about this before, but I've had some guests on here, uh, a lot of the undercover world, uh, Jay Dobbins, uh, Lou Velozzi, Bob Hamer, uh, Lieutenant John Norris. Uh, since with my background in law enforcement, I spent some time in the Secret Service. And so I've always had a, a heartfelt connection to the men and women who serve in law enforcement. Um, and so one of the coolest things I've realized is, yes, I've had actors out here, musicians, all these people, these famous people, whatever, well, quote, unquote, famous. But it's always been the episodes where I've had the, the men and women, the, the life of law enforcement, uh, the people are really drawn to because it's real life superheroes. And to have you guys on here, especially with the dedication and the sacrifices you both made uh, in your careers, uh, it's, again, super rad for you guys to be here. here. Man, that's... Uh... I think you're embarrassing us here. I may blush. Yeah. <laughs> we've been called a lot of names. I don't think we've ever been called a superhero, have we? Uh, and we're not. We're just uh, trying to, like I said, uh, we had a job and, you know, we were assigned to do it and we did it. You know? So before I kind of get into that specific job, what drew you guys both individually into law enforcement? Well, you know what? I started uh, my law enforcement career in 1977 at the sheriff's office in Laredo. And you know what? I'm totally different from Steve. I never wanted to be a cop. It was just an opportunity. I was going to college and they said, hey, uh, sheriff's office has got a new uh, sheriff and they're hiring a whole bunch of deputies. So I applied and there was an opportunity to go to college and work at the same time, like a lot of law enforcement people did, right? So I worked at, uh, I worked a night shift for four years in Laredo, Texas, sheriff's office, and um, went to school during the day. So at the end of the, my, uh, got my degree, there was a posting at the bulletin board. Remember back then there was no internet, there was jobs were placed on the bulletin board, sheriff's office. I mean, DEA was hiring and I didn't even know what DEA was. I had to ask a buddy of mine what it was. So, but it was paying like $10,000 more than what I was making. So that's, that's the, uh, that's the only thing I applied. I said, wow, more money, you know, DEA. And somebody says, Hey, see, join DEA and see the world. And I did. And, you know, I did see the world. So <laughs> that was my short yes, uh, introduction to law enforcement and for me john i wanted to be a cop since i was a little kid i mean since i can remember uh my dad my uncle my dad was a minister we retired my he and my uncle opened a flooring store a carpet store and we moved to west virginia and i was the only son of both families so it was always planned for me to be, you know take over the family business <clears throat> i hated it <laughs> i started working in there at 14 and uh you know it's manual labor so uh Went to college at Western University, uh, got put on academic probation. Dad said, you don't, I don't pay for that. Get your butt back home. Came back home, went to local college that had criminal justice. So unbeknownst to him, I switched over to the CJ program. Um, and then in 75, I was the first college student to do a law enforcement internship. I did a half a summer with the local PD and a half a summer with the sheriff's office. And then that fall, <clears throat> the PD... I uh, gave the, the civil service test. I, I took the test 
came in number one on the test. Uh, got hired in November of 75. I was all of 19 years old by one month. Uh, city cop six years, then railroad cop five and a half years, and then DEA for 26 years. So almost 38 years in law enforcement. Um, you know, the funny thing is my dad didn't recognize, really recognize my law enforcement career until I've been a cop for about five years. <laughs> I love that. One of the, the I mean, this last couple of years has been crazy for everyone, no matter what your field is, but in law enforcement, there was this huge push, and there still kind of is, to defund or to really bad all law enforcement and to hate on them and throw trash at them and all stuff. You guys served and worked in an era kind of before social media, before the news became this media conglomerate where it just goes after whoever they want. How difficult of your life would have been in law enforcement had you had to deal with what some of the law enforcement people today are dealing with? with? Wow. <laughs> go ahead, JP. No, no, go ahead, Chief. Yeah. You know what? Um, let me just say right off the bat, God bless the men and women in uniform right now. I can't imagine a tougher time to be a police officer. You know, we're not, I don't think any of us are old enough to, to have been around in the sixties when they were going through all the riots and that type of thing. Oh. Um, and that, that's one thing I would, you know, having read stories about that in history, seems like that may equate to what some of the things that are going on in today's time. The sad thing is, you know, all these cities where are the, that are, promoting and preaching defund the police have seen a, a sharp spike in violent crimes, including murders, uh, malicious assaults, that type of thing. And so now, you know, they're all like refund the police. Let's get them back in here. It's just ridiculous what's going on. Anybody that had a mindset and, and, you know, I'll probably catch a lot of crap for saying this, but you know, you think what you think and I'll think what I think. Um, anybody that thinks getting rid of the police is going to solve the crime problem in the United States holy cow, where have you been? You got your head in the sand or something? You know, we are the leading consumer country in the world for the cons uh, consumption of illegal narcotics, which leads to so many other crimes. So it just, it just amazes me how politicians will bow down to whatever rhetoric is popular at the time for a vote. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. all it is. And you're right, Steve. I mean, you know, the, the cops are our heroes out there. They're the ones who are protecting us, right? And uh, emergency comes, who do we call? We call 911, you know, and, uh, you know, that's what it's like. Hey, oh, man, I love the police. Yeah, but on the other side of the phone, <laughs> you're trying to defund, uh, you know, their their uh, their efforts. So it, it, it's trying times right now. And uh it's, uh, I, I look at it, but you know, we, the, the, the cops are risking their lives on a daily basis to, to protect us, you know, and it, it's, it's getting to a point where it does have a negative effect. And I'm not going to mention the city or the police officer, right. but remember Steve, we had a situation. I mean, one of the cops, great guy says, guys, you know what, because of all the problems we're getting fired. We're not pulling over anyone. We're just mm -hmm. going to answer calls. And uh, you know what? I'll see a drunk driver. I'll see somebody. But I'm not, you know what? We're, we're getting fired. Uh, why am I going to, you know, but we will answer. I mean, it's, it's to that point. And uh, like I said, I'm not going to say where or how, but, you know, it's, uh, we, we need law enforcement. And, you know, that defund, that's a bunch of, uh, you know, that's a bunch of BS. Garbage. Uh, so as you navigate your way into the DEA, both of you, uh, a two-part question here. I'll start with you, Steve. How aware were you of the, the exploits of Pablo Escobar and the cartels and the, all that stuff? And then when you guys were assigned that, what was your first reaction saying, holy cow, we're going after this guy? I, I'll give you my introduction to DEA. i have been a cop for almost 12 years when I got to DEA. My first post was Miami. Now, before DEA, the Ooh. most the most powder cocaine I'd ever seen at one time was two ounces. So, you know, a little baggy about like this. The first case I got to work on in Miami, uh, undercover, we went down to the Turks and Caicos Islands. We picked up 400 kilos of cocaine. So I went from two ounces to 880 pounds of coke. And what I tell everybody is I was addicted to coke at that point, just in a different way than everybody else, right? Um, <clears throat> all the cases that I worked in Miami, I got there in 87, left in 91. Uh, all the cocaine in South Florida was coming from the Medellin cartel, which was Pablo. Now I never had a case that got up to Pablo's level. We had a lot of guys that did. He was under several indictments in the United States, uh, but I, I was familiar with who he was. 
And then when you get transferred overseas, uh, you know, it's, it's a voluntary transfer. I raised my hand to go. I didn't know that that's the case I was going to be working on. You know how it is. You, you come into a new office, you kind of get to know each other and, and, you know, see where friendships develop and who can get along well. And uh, I had no idea who Javier Pena was at the time. I'd heard about him. I mean, he's, he's somewhat of a legend, to be quite honest with you. He, he won't admit to it, but he is. And he had a partner at the time named Gary Sheridan and Gary and I had some common friends in law enforcement and, and kind of hit it off quicker than Javier and I did. But then Gary got promoted and I'd already started working with both of them. And, and that's how I got assigned to Escobar. And it's, I mean, think about it, man, you're thinking, you know, I wanted to, I, I survived Miami. I mean, I had a partner shot in 89, our informant was killed and we got in a gun battle there. It was a bad day in, in Hialeah. And then you know, if you're going to, if you're going to be a DEA agent, why not go after the biggest drug traffickers in the world? It just, you know, the good Lord put me in the position to work with Javier and, um, that's how it all came about, believe it or not for me. Yeah. And, and as for me, John, we, uh, I started off in 84 in Austin, Texas and in Austin at this time was beginning, uh, to be the music capital of the world. You know, I was listening to, George Strait, oh, yeah. or Free, you know, I mean, there was just some great bands in Austin, Texas. So, you know, I was single, I was having fun. I was working the street stuff. When you come on to DEA, you're, you're doing the basic stuff. A lot of surveillances, you're the gopher. You're the guy who's working out there two, three days watching someone, you know how what that's like, you know? And then um, I was the only Hispanic guy in the office. So, man, I was doing a lot of undercover work. So if, and the, my undercover work were small amounts of quantities, you know, heroin. And believe it or not, remember LSD? <laughs> we had a lot of yeah. LSD wow. in Austin at, at this time. Man. Some weird stories with LSD people. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, undercover type work. Uh, meth, uh, meth was real easy to make. Uh, they, you know, it was a different, uh, they called it the... the, the P2P, phenol 2, propanol. It was a different method of cooking meth. Anyway, so I always want to see the big leagues, right? The major traffickers, how they worked. I, I was learning the street stuff, small type uh, uh, cell head traffickers. So I said, I always want to, you know, see what the other side of the world, the, the big guys work, you know, the professionals. So I applied and I applied for Mexico. I wanted to go to Mexico and my boss comes in and says, Javier, I think there was a mistake because they selected you to go to Colombia. I said, wow, I didn't put in for Colombia. <laughs> yes, I know. He said, you want to fight it? I said, nah, boss, you know what? Nah, I'll, I'll go to Colombia. Let me just go look in the map where Colombia is. So that was my knowledge <laughs> of Colombia at the time. So when I get to Colombia and uh, when I get there in uh, 1988, you know, I'm there about a month. And then all of a sudden my boss says, Javier, uh, well, you're going to be assigned to the Pablo Escobar investigation. I said, really? And I had heard, of, I mean, everybody had knew, but I never, right. I never knew that Pablo Escobar was that major trafficker I, you know like i said once i started working it and it's like wow and then you know steve uh, came in and we became partners and it was something we never expected and uh, i didn't never expect it you know to be working the escobar case and we didn't know it was big at the time to be honest you know when we first started off but what got to be one of got to be the biggest trafficker in the world you know afterwards so cool things in the book again the manhunters is that you guys as you get to know each other and stuff it's amazing how had you not got along together and had there been lots of ego or i'm gonna do it my way this way or this whatever how successful you are as through not only your friendship but your working relationship together and how important is that to have that to have had that type of connection with someone as you're really dealing with the world the most insane uh, cases out there at the time. Yeah, and I'll go first on this because, like Steve says, we know each other. We had heard of each other, and you know, in law enforcement, and uh, you know, and being law enforcement, hey, he's he's a good guy. He's an asshole. You know, you know how that goes. There's <laughs> always somebody. You know, there's always uh, a word. Anyway, so Steve and I, we we know he, we showed up and. It's we were doing things a little bit different, not uh, not your basic investigation. For example, uh, we we started living with the Colombian National Police. We had a specialized group called from Dehin, and this was just a specialized group that had been chosen to go after Pablo Escobar. 
And the officers were not from Medellin because we made a mistake at the beginning when we brought in Medellin officers, Pablo Escobar being Pablo Escobar got to their families. So we had a lot of leaks, corruption type leaks where they were warning Escobar were coming for him. So from there on, we just brought in uh, people that were not from Medellin. So Steve and I showed up and you know how it is when you first meet a partner, you know, you're, we're sizing each other up. It's like anything else. You know, I mean, I knew he was a good guy, uh, but not until we started, you know, trusting each other, then you develop a trust. And, and with us, and Steve knows, we're complete opposites. You know, he's organized. I am disorganized, you know, and uh, we, we had our strengths and, and weaknesses. So we, we it wasn't, uh, like I said, the, the perfect couple, but it, it, it worked because I used his strengths and then, you know, my weaknesses. So it, it, it just, it, it worked. And after a while, uh, we were doing stuff that, you know, when I say stuff that we were not supposed to be doing, I'm talking about uh, going out on operations, you know, uh, basic type right. stuff, you right. know, operations. We were not supposed to, we did it. You know, like and we, we always say in our presentations, we broke policies, rules. We never broke the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it, to me, like you said, and after a while, we trusted each other. I mean, we were, we were living right. together and we knew, like you said, what, what we could uh, and could not do. Yeah, and for me, John, it was, uh, I, um, I came in the perfect situation. You know, Javier had already been in Columbia for three years. Um, here comes this, you know, I'm about as gringo as you get. I come from an English Irish background and, and I really don't blend <laughs> into Hispanic country, you know. <laughs> I stick out like a sore thumb, but um, <clears throat> when I got there, I'll be honest with you, I thought all Colombians were drug traffickers because the only Colombians I ever met were the ones that we put in jail in South Florida, which was a really stupid way to think. You know, that was, uh, I shouldn't stereotype a group like that, but, uh, and, it, and the complete opposite turned out to be the case. Colombians are some of the nicest people in the world. As long as you're, as long as you understand you're in their culture, that you're in their world and you're trying to get along. Now, you come in like the ugly American, they'll treat you like the ugly American, you know, but um, coming in and, and then getting to work with, with JP, the first week I was there is when Escobar surrendered and, and I thought that was a good thing, but, and I saw Javier and, and uh, Gary and the whole embassy was seemed like they're really disappointed. And I thought, what is What's wrong with you guys? I mean, this is the first, world's first narco terrorist and he's in prison. Well, during that first year while I was in prison, I learned why they were disappointed because, you know, they all felt like they'd lost the battle that he had garnered this plea agreement. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and then one year later, as we all know from the history and narcos and everything else right. out there that, um, he escaped. And that's when the, <clears throat> excuse me, the second manhunt started. And, uh, because I was Javier's partner and because he had already uh, gained the respect and trust of the Columbia national police, they accepted me. Now I still had to prove myself to them, you know, that I was willing to work and I could be trusted and, you know, all right. that stuff, but, uh, I came into a great position. So if I'd come in with, uh, uh, you know, that big ego and like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to show you how to do your job. Well, well, first of all, Javier would have cut me off the knees, you know, and second of all, Mr. Toff would probably have sent me back to the States. <laughs> so and, uh, they could pronounce Steve. So they called him stick, <laughs> yeah. but you know what, John, one of the things that always, and, and Steve and I always talked about it is we're not going to tell this guys what to do. Right. And that's, the mistake that sometimes when you go into a foreign country, here comes uh, the, the gringo telling them, you know, it's their country. We're there as guests. We're there to help them out. And that's one of the principles that I think work for us mm-hmm. is we were not the, you know, that ugly American. Hey, yeah, this is fucked up. You can't do this. You know, it was just, we would like, hey guys, what about this? And you know what, what, what was critical? And they even later on, they told us, you know what, uh, you guys give us back information. <laughs> a lot of times it's a one way street. We give, uh, we would give other people information. We would never hear back from us. Steve and I would always, hey guys, remember that number you gave us? Uh, well, we arrested the guy in Miami and now here are numbers for Columbia. You know, that type of stuff where it, it was a two way street. So we were feeding them a lot of information and, You know what, the biggest compliment we ever received, uh, and we'll talk about it here in a little bit, but we had other other sources, right? We we had the Delta guys, uh, SEAL Team 6 guys with us. 
this guys were some of the, the best guys in the world. And we mm -hmm. always say, we're kidnapped. We want those guys to come after us. They could, these guys are phenomenal. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, all the TV shows on them, they're all correct. They're, they're the best in the world. Anyway, but their orders from the Pentagon and the ambassador, and there were other U.S. sources, they could not leave the base. So they abided by those rules. Uh, but they were, you know, training our cops uh, uh, in tactics, uh, providing us uh, uh, great intelligence where Escobar was. It, one of the greatest compliments go back to is one of the cops one night were saying, hey, Javier, how come you and Stick, call him Stick, Man, you guys are always out there risking your lives on a daily basis, coming with us, coming out with us on operations. And what about those rest of the gringos? Why don't they come out with us? And obviously, we couldn't tell them the right. real truth. But you know what? That to me was one of the best compliments we ever uh, received being there. That's why I loved it. But towards the end of the book, and you show the picture of you, Steve, with his body, and it was really cool how you guys you kind of described how they were just as happy that like you were happy of them that they were able to kill him and can't get him, get rid of him. But they were just as happy to see you guys there after all your hard work. And we want you to experience this with us, like how happy you are. And I thought that was really endearing how you guys kind of put that forth in the book. One of the interesting things, JP, you talked about was the idea of corruption. And I've always been really fascinated the idea of that, especially down there with a guy like this, a guy, that could pay off the debt of the country at $10 billion or pay off the media, uh, pay off politicians, military, law enforcement, whoever he wanted to just to do what he wanted. And one of our questions, Fernando, who's actually our graphic designer here on the podcast, he lives in South America. And so he's, he's always been very fascinated. And I guess his question to you guys is, how hard is it to do your job when the, some of the people in the media at the time would have him make him seem like this huge humanitarian where he's always given a charity and buying schools where they make it seem like he's a sexy saver. Like how, how much does that hurt you guys at the time as you're trying to figure out who to trust and kind of find out where he is? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Uh, let me take a stab at this. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. The, his political, his press campaign, this is why Escobar one of the main things he would do was kidnap who the press people you know and uh, one of the yep yeah, and that way he would convince them hey, i'm gonna let you live but you go out there and you better write a positive article on me uh, portray a great image uh and i remember one of the great journalists in colombia her name was diana Turbay. her father was one of the presidents of Colombia. Very important journalist. Anyway, they, they kidnap her. Uh, and when our cops go in on the, you know, try to rescue her, uh, they shot pretty much everybody in the rescue attempt. She was, they were taking her out. One of the Sicarios had not died and he shoots her, shot her in the back and she ended up dying. Uh, and it was wow, the cops, I mean, the president, they were all against the cops. Why did you all go in? We were negotiating. Uh, you know what? But it, it was just a tragic situation. But then, you know, Escobar had kidnapped another mayor of, uh, of uh, Colombia at that time, Andres Pastrana, who later became president. But they talked about it's, you know, you're, you're a hostage and Escobar wanted you to write sto good stories about him. And then the congressmen, there was a lot of congressmen who were corrupt at that time. Pablo Escobar was paying them off and he was, he was paying them off for no extradition, basically vote on the constitution that we do not extradite people. So his, his press campaign was aimed at that. And you've heard that Robin uh, Hood, uh, right? You know, persona. Yes. Uh, you yes. know, and, and take you to the rich, to give to the poor of that. But, uh, you know, I tell people, did Robin Hood uh, put a bomb on a commercial airline where he killed 107 <sighs> innocent people? Did Robin Hood kill the next president of Colombia, Luis Carlos Galan? And so it was just that campaign that he had. But, you know, I'll let Steve go. But like I said, Pablo Escobar was no Robin Hood. Yeah. So if you think about it, John, <clears throat> Now, you know, Pablo did spend his own money and built housing for people that lived on the edge of a trash dump. And, and that is a good thing. 
But you're talking about a guy who, according to Forbes magazine, was worth, you know, upwards of $30 billion. So he spent a couple million dollars to help people out. That's a good thing. But what's what's $2 million or you know, a few million dollars to somebody who has $30 billion? You know, it's nothing. But it wasn't because he said, hey, I just want to give this to you. You know, here's some clinics, here's some sporting fields, things like that. When he, you know, at one point he had as many as 500 Sicarios protecting him. Now, as those Sicarios were killed in firefights with the, with the police and the military down there and, and rival drug gangs and so forth, when he needed to recruit new Sicarios, where do you think he went and recruited from? Right back right, in those barrios. That's exactly right. So there's, all, there's always a payback. You know, nothing in life is free. If it, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. You know, those are pretty simple uh, facets to, to live by, tenants to live by. Um, and the sad thing was he might go in and say, you know, I mean, he's hugging these people and he's kissing them and he's giving out money, he's giving out food. And he's like, you know, my, my people, I need, Pablo needs uh, 50 people who, 50 Sicarios who are willing to come and fight for Pablo and die for Pablo. And the sad thing is he might have two or 300 step up. I'll, I'll work for you, Pablo. I'll work for you. And here's the really sad part. The ages of these people that were volunteering were like 15 to 20. I mean, young teenagers. And, you know, they're probably seeing this is going to be my best shot in life. But, I mean, you know what the end of that is. It's either prison or a bullet. Uh, so we refer to Pablo not as Robin Hood, but as a master manipulator because he manipulated all those people. You know what? You go to that uh, barrio down there now. They call it Barrio Pablo Escobar. You better not say anything bad about Pablo because you might not get out of there alive. <laughs> He's still a hero to them. Yeah. And, and let me just tell you a little story, man. I, I interviewed a 15-year-old, I was going to say a kid, a thug, basically. And uh, uh, we arrested him, and uh, I got to interview him. And uh, wow, you know, I'll never forget that interview. He, he was 15 years old at the time. And he confessed to me, when Pablo declared war on Colombia, he put bounties on police officers, $100 a head. Can you imagine $100 a head for a human Jeez. life? Anyway, so uh, he started telling me, he says, you know what? He said, Escobar pulled my mom and me out of the slums. We were living in a cardboard box, eating garbage, wherever we could find it. He pulled us out. He, he bought us a house. He gave us money for food. He said, I owe my life to Pablo Escobar, so I will kill and I will die for Pablo Escobar. He said, I'm 15 years old. He says, I'll be dead by 22, 23 years old. I'm not going to make it out of the streets of Medellin. But my allegiance is to die for Pablo Escobar, and I'll kill anyone he wants uh, me to kill. Then he confessed to me that he said, you know what, you know, I get $100 a head for any police officer I kill. I've already killed 10. He started telling me where he killed them. He said, I just walk behind them when they're walking a beat, put a gun to the back of their head, shoot them. No big deal. At the end of the day, I go to this house. I say, hey, how many did you kill? I killed three. Here's $300. He said, that money goes to my mother. He says, I give everything. And if there's something left over, it's my beer money. As long as I got a nice pair of jeans, nice pair of tennis shoes. Life is good, but I will die and kill for Pablo Escobar. So what we say is you multiply that attitude by the 500 Chicago's. And that's one of the, I think one of the factors, because they asked us, they always, how did we, the mistakes we made is very simple. We weren't used to going after a trafficker with this type of Sicario attitudes, right? I mean, we're in the States. We knock off a, a drug trafficker. We get his his guys, maybe four or five, they're in it for the money. Whereas Pablo Escobar was in it for the Plata or Plomo, what we have in our shirts, you know, money or, 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 or a bullet. That's, and that's a very different war tactic than just going after regular drug trafficking. It's fascinating that you, you talk about Sicarios and a lot of times for me, it feels like at least reading the book and watching the television show that every time you cut the head off one snake, a couple more would pop up or that family that you, he bought the house for now has two older sons that are picking up the guns. And so does it ever get, this is going to lead into the, the big question here, which is you, you always talk about in the book that you there'd be times you get to his place where the coffee's still warm or the cigarettes just got lit or the foot, footsteps out of a shower is still on the floor. At what point 
with all your hard work and stuff that you guys did over the years, when stuff like that would happen, how how hard would it be to not feel like dejected or deterred that man, are we ever gonna? This guy's actually a ghost. Like, how do you guys kind of mentally and physically deal with those situations where you kill a Sicario, but here come two more, or now you're back to square one and stuff like that? Like, how do you guys wake up every morning knowing you might have lost him that night before and you might not get that chance again? Well, it was, uh, it was frustrating. Um, you know, we, there were so many times that we came close, especially right after the escape, you know, and the, and the problem ended up being that the Colonel, it wasn't Colonel Hugo Martinez. It was another Colonel who, as Javier says, was very weak. Um, you know, this guy, he was more about pomp and circumstance than he was doing the job. You know, you've got this search block created. That's a 600 man force whose sole responsibility is to, to track and try to capture kill Pablo Escobar and decimate the Medellin cartel, you know, and, and at that time, the, uh, the U S operators, the Delta and, and seal guys were using different assets to collect information. Plus the Columbia police were getting tips from their informants. We were getting tips and there were times when, you know, we had very credible information to where he was within that first couple months. And so you go to the, to this colonel and wake him up in the middle of the night, and, you know, colonel, we, we need some manpower. You know, we need a couple cars. And he's like, Oh, it's in the middle of the night. We've got roll call at 6 AM. And then we've got PT and then we got to have breakfast, you know, and I'm, I'm planning on doing an inspection of the troops tomorrow and, and all this stupid stuff. that has got nothing to do with your mission, you know? And, and finally it got to the point where the ambassador is calling Javier bitching him out. Why aren't you guys capturing him? You're getting all this information. You know, and, and finally, we just had to lay it out. Here's the problem. You got to replace this guy. And so that's what happened. And when they brought Colonel Martinez back, that's when things started progressing. But by that time, you know, three, three months have gone by, three or four months into the manhunt. Pablo's, you know, well on the run now. He's already established his little hidey holes and things like that. And uh, it just kind of drug out and drug out. And, and quite honestly, the day that Pablo was killed, when I went to Colonel Martinez's office to listen to the operation, um, the first thing in your mind is, man, I hope this is not another wild goose chase. Thank good Lord it wasn't that day. Yeah. But going back, John, to your point, yeah, there were many times when we wanted to give up. Steve and I, we'd go back and, and you know what? It got to the point where we were saying, let's just let him surrender, give him what he wants. Let's all go home. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, yeah. And then a couple of times there towards the end, we'd go in and, and you're right, the coffee was still warm, you know, and Escobar always had a, a had a cook with him and a young girl with him. And when we'd interview him, they say, yeah, they, he heard y'all coming. He got a phone call. Uh, the, the problem was some of the mountain sites he was hiding out was just very difficult. If you can picture a, a mountain site in the, you know, in the jungles of Colombia, the only way you come come in is in helicopter, and you know he'd hear him, and then people would hide him. And so it was it was very depressing, because like I said, the coffee was still warm, and you know I remember the one of them, the cook, uh, and, and Colonel Martinez. Remember Steve? You, I mean, he tried manpower on the ground because he knew the helicopters, but he was still managed to get away. And yeah. and I remember, you know, we, we talked to the cook and said, yeah, hey, he heard y'all, he was here with us and, you know, he got away. And uh, so it was very depressing, but yeah, there were many times you're like, just, you know what, you know, and then the, the car bombs, let's just let him surrender. We all go home. But, yeah. We, uh, before you jump out here, Steve, Javier and I were kind of laughing about technology and how it's a necessary evil, but I can't help but wonder, would this chase have taken as long as it did had you had the technology and the type of resources we do today when it comes to technology and gear? Or is this the type of thing where this guy was going to be this guy no matter what what was happening in the world around him? Well, he's not going to change. And, and you got to remember, you know, as government employees, the equipment we have comes from the lowest bidder on the contracts, right? <laughs> Correct. So money is always consideration. Whereas for the drug traffickers, it's never a consideration. They have the latest and greatest. Now, given what's available today with encryption, with end to end encryption on telecommunication devices and so forth, we wouldn't have gotten any of those phone intercepts. I don't think, cause he would have, he would have invested. I mean, even if it's just WhatsApp or, you know, whatever it might be, right. Uh, it would have been more difficult. Uh, 
you know, using devices like Triggerfish and some of the things, especially that the marshals use to look for people that may have helped at a lower level, but I, I quite honestly, I think it would have been much more difficult. Um, you know, and I mean, the truth is, uh, when it comes to that group, Los Pepes, which was a, you know, group of murdering vigilantes, which we don't condone. The truth is they had a lot to do with bringing Pablo down there at the end. They used his own tactics against him. You know, that Pablo, when he would kill people, he'd throw a card down on the ground and said the extraditables, we prefer a tomb in Colombia to a jail cell in the United States. So Los Pepes, when they kill somebody that was associated with Escobar, they would, they made these crude cardboard signs and laid them on the bodies. You know, Pablo, how's it feel? We're using, you know, your tactics against you. Uh, that was um, arguably one of the best things that ever happened for us. I mean, they were taking out his, his organization people and it was anything from from sicarios to criminal associates to attorneys to school teachers to doctors you know anybody that was supporting the escobar family was a, a potential target for los pepes and what happened is they created just as much fear as pablo escobar created through his bombings and murders and uh it got to the point where pablo just didn't have a lot of places to run to so that you know that's kind of the truth of the story there right it's so one of the cool things I'm going to kind of wrap my head around, when you guys do the DEA there present, were, how aware are you of possible other, other agencies involved? Like, did everything filter through the DEA to you guys? And when it came to new evidence and stuff, what was the chain of command like in terms of the military, the local law enforcement, everything through you guys? Like, kind of, can you do a run through of like what that actually, you guys got a piece of intel. Who does that filter through and how did it filter through those agencies? You know what, uh, the, the basic intel, because of Steve and I being there with them, you know, the, our intel used to come in from, uh, for example, we, we got a lot from Miami. A lot of DEA uh, intelligence was coming in, and we uh, we were right there, so we would get it, and we'd pass it on right away to the, to the cops, you know. As far as the other organizations and you know everybody knows we had a couple of cia guys here and let me go on the record you know they hated me and i hated them there was no love lost that is correct <laughs> i'm being honest you know, they threatened to indict me for for treason you know and, and it was just the biggest jealousy type that's all it was we're the drug experts they're the communism experts right uh you know they used to call us uh da was uh Tumba puertas, right? You you knock a door down, and CIA yeah. was tumba países. They knock countries down, you know. So it's a very we're the drug experts, and you know when Escobar they they tried to come in and saying they were the experts, which they're not. They didn't have any intelligence. We you know we were Steve and I. We were the direct liaison guys to the to the police. Uh, but uh, you know, but by being there, that and like I said. That tactic, and I'm not sure who came up with it. We were invited by the Colombian government. We just didn't show up. Hey, we're going to, you know, they asked for right. us by, by name, you know, Penny and Murphy, we want them to be with us. And that is, that's one of the best tactics because by being there and we're getting firsthand information, mm -hmm. we're getting it right off the press. It would be either intercepts, interviews. I mean, when we were passing information to DEA Miami, Steve, we would write about what? And Steve would write about 10 teletypes mm -hmm. a day. And you know, the teletype is, is just basically a paper saying, hey, this guy's in Miami. This guy's running the markets for Escobar. This guy in uh, South Florida is buying airplanes for Escobar. It, it, it was just perfect in that it was an organization, and this is one of the things we learned that was the success is when you go after an organization, you go after everybody. You just don't go after one person. You don't go after Pablo Escobar. You go after the distributors, the guys who are buying the airplanes, the guys who's moving money, you know what I'm saying, and, and the Sicarios. And I think this operation was a success because everybody was vested into it. Yeah, even Europe was was helping us out. I mean, all over the world, you know, the, there was traffic or so. But by being the by being there with them, it was I think one right. of the factors we had. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you get the three hundred thousand dollar bounties on your heads, 
when I see that, my thought, my first thought is, wow, these guys are onto something or they're scared of Pablo that they're going to take him down. Does that creep into your head or is it one of these things where like, man, I got a family or I want to start a family. I need to get out of here. Like, is my life really worth? So when that first comes out there, does that drive you guys into further uh, pushing to grab him or do you have to kind of take a step back and kind of recollect yourselves? You know, for me, when I got there, um, like I said, Javier and I have been there three years, and, and you know, that first couple of weeks, they tell you there's a bounty on your head uh, of 300000 It's a little disconcerting. <laughs> you know, it's uh, – uh, but you know how we are in law enforcement. You know, it's almost like, well, that's a challenge. You know, let's see if he can catch me, uh, which is not a really smart challenge to take, but I, well, you know how we are. We, we, you get used to it. You are hyper vigilant. You know, pretty much the whole time, if you're outside your the embassy or your home, you know, you're extremely aware of everything that's going around you. You don't become paranoid because, if you, you know, if you get if you can become scared, then you can't think logically. You can't think of how to get yourself out of a situation. So uh, and my wife, she was as good at it as I was. But um, what I like to joke around about that three hundred thousand dollar bounty is that my the, the biggest danger I faced is my wife would kill me in my sleep because I was worth more dead than I was alive. <laughs> That's always a factor, and, and you know, like you said, uh, with, with me is uh, and, and he he knew Pablo Escobar who we were. Man, we were assigned to the base. In the base, let me just try to explain it. It's an old police base. It was set up in a barrio of Medellin, a, a poor neighborhood of Medellin. So Steve and I, for relaxation, there was a little bar called Candilejas. And you would leave the base, and it was burgers, beers, you know, after working four or five days straight, you know, obviously we needed relaxation, and we'd go have a couple of beers. We, and I think we, we'd we bought everybody a beer. They would always, oh, Stephen, how are you out here? They're buying, of course. Yep. We'd, bring them. We'd, always, yeah. we'd always buy. They loved us, you know. And uh, But so everybody knew, you know, who we were. So Pablo Escobar knew, like I said, and there's intercepts where he would mention our names. And uh, so uh, that that's, uh, that's another factor that, you know, we were uh, very, very careful uh, with. So one of our avid listeners, Lori, was wondering, and it's a great question, do you still worry about retaliation at all in terms of a family member or a, a, a distant relative or someone who just still has a bone to pick with you guys? You know what, for, for me, and uh, it, it was easier for me than Steve, and I'll let him, because, you know, his wife, but with me, I, I was single. All my life, gotcha. pretty much. But what happened with the Medellin cartel is that everybody was taken down. You know, air, there was no person left. Uh, the latest guy was a guy named Popeye Sicario. He got out of prison three years now. He died uh, not too long ago. But he's got more media <laughs> shows than we do. You know, he's always on TV, right. but now he's just one of those. But we, nah, I, I don't worry. I mean, because like I said, it's a, it's, it's an old case. Uh, now, as far as, you know, and I'll let Steve, but even we get some nasty emails, right, Steve, about people oh, yeah. trying to kill us, but it's all BS, you know, it's all, uh, you know, they love Pablo Escobar, they hate us. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried. Yeah, and, and you know what, what JP just told you there, you know, that's the way you should go after a criminal organization is you take the entire organization out and you just don't chop the head of the snake off because it regrows. And believe it or right. not, that's the first time a Colombian international drug manufacturing and distribution organization was completely decimated, you know, which uh, to, to JP and I, it just made sense that that's how you would do it. Um, but I guess, that you know, as we learned later, that was the first time it happened. So that kind of became... Um, a way of doing investigations, I guess. Uh, we get credit for a lot of things. I'm not sure we deserve credit for, but the uh, we get that question everywhere. Even some of the neighborhoods I've moved into, people come up and after they find out who you are, they're like, "Should we be worried? Are you know, are, are those Sicarios going to come and try to kill you and maybe kill us by accident?" It's like, you know what? If that's the biggest stones you got, maybe you should move. You know, because I'm not moving. But um, right. it's it's. I don't worry about, it. I don't go out, you know, I don't go out looking for trouble and, and neither of us do, 
Uh, but we've been all around the world on our speaking tour. This is our seventh year. And other than some nasty comments, you know, for people in the audience every once in a while, it usually has to do with a little bit too much to drink. Uh, but on social media, like JP said, man, we get some stuff on there that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Want to cut our heads off and shit down our throats. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it's, it's terrible. I, uh, when, when I posted that you guys were going to do this, I got like two messages from people. And I got them last time with Lou Velozzi. Anyone that's undercover, whether it's a biker gang or some of these entities, some of the people that follow, that support the people that they're like, fuck those guys. You don't you, you don't understand what really happened down there. And they're saying this to me like, two days ago. And I, I don't respond because I'm just like, what do you? I, I, so obviously, you know, you're doing something right. Um, so before we talk about this speaking tour and stuff, the day he dies, obviously there's a sense of relief. I love the, again, Steve, where you were worried that someone from above would be like, oh, why are you taking a picture of him? A U.S. citizen killed Pablo. And I love that the first thought in your head was, on this great day that this, that, this, my, this, that, this terrorist is dead, people back home would first saw me, well, he should have been there and all this stuff. I, I just love the, the nuances of that. But when he's dead, it, 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 a couple of days later, as you decompress, were you ever kind of like, you know what? I could step away from this. I've already put close to 20 years in. I, I've, I've done a really good service to the world, to wherever. What made you guys still stay in law enforcement? Well, uh, for me, um, and, and just to reiterate, for people that don't know, I was not on the roof when Pablo was killed. I was back at the base. That was a straight out Columbia National Police operation. There were no American operators there. Uh, there's a rumor right. in, the, in, the, in the military community that a Delta operator sniper killed Pablo. You can, uh, Jerry Boykin was the, uh, General Jerry Boykin was the head of Delta during that time. And I've heard him speak, he and I are still friends to this day. And I've heard him say publicly, the people that killed Pablo Escobar were the Columbia National Police, nobody else. You know, I mean, he'll, he'll tell you right. straight up. But <clears throat> what I love being a cop. I was a cop for almost 38 years. I never wanted to retire. Um, probably wouldn't have if Netflix hadn't come along with the Narco series. Um, but here's the cool thing. When I got back to the U.S. after, so Escobar was killed in December 93. I transferred back in June 94, and I think JP came out in September 94 to Puerto Rico and I went to North Carolina. When I got to North Carolina, you know, some of the people there knew what I'd done and been involved with and some didn't. And it wasn't something you talked about. If they asked me, I'd tell them, but you know, you don't go in and you don't go in a new office and say, Hey guys, I killed Pablo Escobar last week. What'd y'all do? You know, <laughs> cause you're not going to develop any friendships that way. Right. But for me right. at that point, I felt like I didn't have to prove myself to anybody, you know, it just, As and, you should, and, right? Quite honestly, the criminal investigations got to be so much more fun. I was working with a bunch of state and local guys in North Carolina, in the middle district of North Carolina. Just, I'd never seen crack cocaine. And that's what the, the scourge was in that part of the country at that time. I just had a freaking blast, made some lifelong friends that I still stay in touch with. Uh, that's when being a criminal investigator really, really got to be, uh, I don't know if people understand when I say fun, it was challenging. But I always thought, you know, I look at life as an adventure, and that was just one heck of an adventure that was a lot of fun to be involved with. And, and as for me, I, I wasn't there that day. And, and it really was, well, was, you know, because I started, I started chasing him in 88, you know, and uh, then towards the end, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm glad Steve was there. And you know what, Steve had the only camera, uh, you know, that, that, that day. But, and it's not like the Netflix series portrays, you know, it, uh, basically right. I was ordered by the ambassador to go to Miami because there was an informant who got a hold of the ambassador only wanted to talk to me. So, uh, you know, I tried to argue with the ambassador and he pretty much says, if you don't go on kicking you out of the country. So I had to go. And, you know, the irony is that it's the informant who's on the phone and he, and, uh, he dropped the phone and told me, where they just killed Pablo Escobar. That's the irony for me, man. So I went oh, back. Man. I know, I know. So I went back to Columbia that same night, went out to the cop the next day, picked up Steve and, you know, celebrated. But uh, that was the hour. But after Columbia, I, I did 30 years in DEA. I went to Puerto Rico, then went to San Francisco, Washington, Puerto Rico, ended up in Houston. 
as the agent in charge, and as you know, as an SES senior, Steve and I were both senior selected as senior executive uh, service, which is the highest promotion you can get. So, and also that goes to show I was not a dirty agent. You know, that, that's one of the big things as when we do our European tours, uh, Mr. Pena, we know you were dirty. How much money did you get, and all that sort of thing? That 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 was. A, that's called a so uh, as we license from Netflix. Did you guys ever envision that a show like Netflix Narcos or you'd be on the road for seven years uh, touring, writing a book about your, your, I mean, at the time, it's probably one of those things where, again, the media and sensationalism, of what you actually did, like it's a forethought, but in this day and age, like me reading about this, I'm just so enthralled by like these, pe these real life people like you two that actually did this. And this isn't some Hollywood thing where it's all completely made up. And so if you guys actually live this life and now get to talk about it around the world or to be a part of a television show that really made people understand kind of, yes, there's some Hollywood aspect to it, but really understand the type of stuff and work you guys actually did down there. So like when this all happens, are you kind of like, man, this is insane. You know what? Never in a million years. And I remember, remember when the first show came out, I called Steve and said, Steve, this is a bunch of shit. No one's gonna watch this shit. Man, this, show, this show is gonna be a flop, and boy, was I for a surprise afterwards. And you know what, John? We uh, a, a year or two before that, uh, I was in headquarters. I was running the. Um, I was detailed over DOJ my last few years. Ran the Osted Fusion Center, and Javier was the sack down in Houston at the time. And uh, uh, a buddy of mine in Northern Virginia introduced me to two different Hollywood producers with the idea that they would do something with the Escobar story. And I kept telling the guy, nobody's interested in this story. And Javi and I were the exact same opinion. Nobody really cares. And both of those producers wanted to take our story and make political statements out of it, you know, and that's not, oh, I mean, you know, yeah. we're, we're about as apolitical as you get, you know, we'll make fun of politicians on both sides of the aisle there. It's, it's they're just yeah. so easy. They're such easy targets, you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, but then, so when this guy calls this guy named Eric Newman, we were introduced to a, a retired Marine that Javier and I worked with in Columbia. And so I called Eric out in Hollywood and he kind of pitched it on the phone and I listened to it and I said, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. And I know Eric about fell out of his chair because <clears throat> we have since learned people will sell their souls in Hollywood to be on TV. And so he says, Hey, if I, I'm coming to Washington on some other business and I'm bringing two writers, would you have dinner with us? Now, and this is honest guys truth. I'm not making this up. I'm thinking that's going to be a free dinner at a really good restaurant. Yes, I will go. <laughs> so, you know, I brought the personal car in that day, went to the, went to dinner with them and, and, and I'm in touch with Javier, you know, we're doing everything jointly and just our personalities clicked with Eric and the two writers. Um, and so at the end of the night, you know, we're getting ready to leave. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll talk to JP, but I think maybe we should follow up with you guys. Let's see if this is going to go anywhere, you know, and you know, but I'm not sure your listeners do. If you work for the government, you can't make money on the side. So it would Correct. mean we would have to retire. Um, uh, and as we're walking out the door, Eric said, well, just one more question. He said, why are you and Javier so hesitant to tell your story? And I said, you know, one, we don't think anybody's interested Two, the last thing we want to happen is that anybody would ever sensational, a guy sensational, a guy sensationalize a guy like Pablo Escobar, who's right. the world's first narco terrorist, the world's most wanted criminal and a mass murderer. Right. And Eric promised that night, he said, I promise you, we will never do that. And to this day, in our opinion, Eric Newman has lived up to his word. I mean, he's, he's been a true gentleman to Javier and I both. We love the series. We thought it was going to be a flop and shows you how little we know about <laughs> Hollywood because it's one of the best shows Netflix has ever had. And, and after it came right. out, then that's, you know, we, we started the speaking business because we were getting calls. Hey, can you all come in and talk, you know, uh, you know, police organizations, uh, corporate organizations, universities. So we basically had to hire an agent because we didn't know anything about, you know, the how much money and all that sort of thing. So we right. hired a, a GTN, right? Uh, yeah, eventually we went to a couple yeah. of greater talent networks. That's where right. we are now. But the, anyway, so the, the speaking business, like I said, for five years, we were like, is it all over the world? Never at home. Uh, it, it was fun. But like I said, it's a lot of people think it's glamorous. The only like I said, we, we'd see the venue, you'd see the airport and you'd see the hotel. And it's, a, it. it's fun when you tell the story, because, <laughs> you know, in our story, our presentations is the actual history 
of the rise and fall of Pablo Escobar and his cartel. And we told the truth, not the TV version, not the, the conspiracy. We, we were there and we have our own photos, videos. And we, I mean, we sold out the Sydney Opera House. That's one of our biggest uh, feathers in our, in our cabs. Yeah, you know? So not the Sydney Opera House. I mean, that's a unique experience. And that's kind of, as we kind of wrap this up, like obviously people could buy your book anywhere. Um, Amazon has a Barnes and Noble. Highly recommend getting it. For the speaking tour stuff, obviously it's the world opens up again and people are kind of doing this stuff again. I know you guys will be in the road again soon. What can people anticipate? Will the show be something similar to what it was before? Or do you guys have new ideas and stuff where you kind of present stuff again? Well, for the, for the show now, as far as the book, you, you're right. You can get it just about anywhere. Uh, if you want to get an autographed and, and personalized copy, you can get it either through our website, deanarcos.com or eBay. And eBay allows us to ship internationally so we can ship outside the U.S. Um, as far as the speaking tours, it will probably continue the same because we have so many other projects that we're working um, our, our requests are coming in a little more frequently now, just every time we start rolling COVID, you know, another variation of COVID yeah. hits and it just knocks the breath out of everything. Um, pretty much right now, everything are, are private events, conferences, uh, private groups. Um, there's the podcast is keeping us pretty busy with the interviews and the bonus content and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're working on a couple of other projects, uh, potential TV series that we, we can't say too much about right now. Um, we're working, uh, Javier and I are the lead investigators on it with a group of guys. It's called the Lost Clipper, where we're trying to uh, find the bodies of 15 Americans killed in 1938 over in the South Pacific in Micronesia. And we wow. have information that indicates that it may be directly tied to the disappearance of Amelia Earhart in 1937. So, but with COVID, you know, I was over there yep. uh, about a year before COVID. I went over with the team and we spent two weeks searching. We brought ground penetrating radar and some different things. And um, since then, because the country shut down because of COVID, uh, we have brought a scientist on board and done a lot of, uh, not experiments, but a lot of research and plotting. And uh, we think we've got a really, really good indication of where those 15 bodies might be buried. And so we want to take cadaver dogs with us over. Um, so it's, you know, when you add all this stuff up together, it's amazing. We've got uh, an, another potential limited series podcast that we're working on. Um, this is the last. I, I do thing. want to. This is the last thing we ever thought right. we'd be doing in retirement. <laughs> I love it because you guys are generally happy with what you're doing now. I think a lot of times people retire and don't find a passion to continue kind of living, not listen, doing the same stuff, but in the same world. And the one of the things I love about the Game of Crimes podcast is that you will have other people on your show that maybe undercover agents, other people that are the law enforcement, but you also have guests on there that live on the other side of the dime. Uh, maybe some bad guys, some traffickers and stuff like that who've come around and how, like, how cool is it for you guys to just, could, when you listen to your podcast, you, you are generally happy and excited talking about not only your career, but learning about someone else's career.